Friends, today's NRI Samai program from Los Angeles brought to you commercial free by listeners like you. Your generous donations make possible for us to stay commercial free. And today's show is pre recorded. If you have a question for the guest, please send an email to nri samai at gmail.com. We will follow up with the guest and find the answer for you. Thank you for your support. Uh, Professor Kirk Smith, uh, welcome to NRI Samai Radio. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was uh, enlightening to listen to you yesterday in your speech. And uh, I would like to know more about your association and fascination with India since you have visited it uh, so many times and so much of your significant work is uh, based in India. Mm. So could you tell us about it? Well, I first coming started, um, well, I first visited India in 1972, um, but that was with a as a student, you know, with a backpack and long hair. Um, but then I started working in India in the late 70s after my doctoral degree. I've always been um, interested in this part of the world, I think probably because my uncle had um, been uh, country manager in India for Caltex Oil. Um, and I had many stories about India. So I started coming here. So I have a kind of a personal connection. but. India, you know, been here 90 times or something like that. Been here t- um, several times on sabbatical with my family, my wife and daughter, and have many friends, and uh, visited many parts of the country, worked in many places. It's, you know, India is a difficult place to work in some ways. It's very intense, and things move slowly, and, and there are always complications, uh, political and cultural complications. But to me, it's fascinating, and. I do see some progress uh, over the years, and so it's nice to be have a small role in helping with that progress. How many times have you come here? Well, I don't know exactly, around 90, something like that. 90 times. Uh, yeah. And uh, I was going through your work mm-hmm. on your website and elsewhere last night and, and got to see that uh, village rural household chulha, mm-hmm. the, the wood stove. Mm-hmm and uh, its uh, effect, environmental damage and health damage, mm-hmm. you have worked so much on that. So could you explain that how much is the health cost and how much is the damage to environment because mm-hmm. of this single factor? Well, let's see. I mean, I was, um, when I first um, came to India to work, it was in uh, 1978, I was working on a rural energy project, looking at use of uh, better fuels in rural areas to improve quality of life. And so I started um, spending some time in villages. And, and in the villages, I noticed this very smoky conditions inside houses. Uh, so I went back um, to my job in the U.S. and I looked, tried to find somebody who had done measurements. Couldn't find anybody who had done any measurements. Of course, we didn't have the Internet those days, but I searched through the libraries and my students and I. So I decided we should maybe we should do some measurements. Has nobody done any? So I borrowed some equipment and uh, worked with colleagues in Gujarat, and we did measurements in the Anand area of Gujarat, and um, found these very high pollution levels. Um, and since then, we've we and many other people have done many more studies, also confirming these very high pollution levels. So here it is. 60% or so of the Indian population is exposed to these very high pollution levels every day. And, um, you know, higher than even the worst city, um, Delhi being perhaps the worst city. But uh, um, ba- Delhi's bad enough, but um, in these uh, villages, it's even worse. And, of course, these are poor people, and it's women and their young children who are most exposed. Yeah. So it seemed likely there would be big health effects, but since there nobody done any measurements, nobody had done any studies yeah. either. And so we, um, we decided to start you know, doing some health studies. So I worked with colleagues here and elsewhere, and, and we did studies on child pneumonia and uh, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and um, cataracts and uh, low birth weight in children, uh, heart disease, um, tuberculosis. Um, I'm probably forgetting some. Uh, cognitive effects in children. Not only in India, but in other parts of the world. Yeah, developing countries. Yeah, and all in developing countries where, you know, people are using biomass for cooking. Your conclusion is uh, very strong that it is the single most uh, big, it is the single strongest, uh, most damaging environmental damage. Uh. Well, it's not exactly my conclusion. I mean, this is what the World Health Organization and the, and the big global burden of disease um, you know, project is now saying. I went from nobody even noticing it 
yeah. in, in 1980 to the first measurements in 1981 to now being the largest single environmental health risk in the country in the world. Now, outdoor air pollution is bad too, but it's just not as quite as bad as this household air pollution. And for many years, we called it indoor air pollution because it usually starts indoors. But we stopped calling it that because that, that implies that it's somehow not a problem when it goes outdoors. Yeah. But it's still a problem. It's, yeah. It adds to outdoor air pollution. So we, now we call it yeah. household air pollution, meaning it comes from dirty fuels at the household. Yeah. yeah. So your conclusion, our conclusion of WHO, have you seen it uh, influencing and affecting government of India policies? Well, yes. I mean, it has influenced policies. I mean, um, the, um, the Ministry of Petroleum, I mean, let's say the, in the budget speech this year, uh, February 29th, the, the uh, finance minister um, announced a 8,000 crore being devoted to um, bringing LPG uh, clean fuel to um, 50 million BPL families, 10, 5 crore BPL families in three years. And that's because of health concerns. I mean, you look at the messages, you know, the big, the big banners with Modi sitting there and make, give it up, give up your LPG subsidies to make a poor man's kitchen clean. Yeah. Other than I don't think men have kitchens. It, yeah. It's a, um, the message is a health message. Now, of course, they don't talk about it, numbers of cases of pneumonia or something like that. But it is a health message. And that health message, I mean, it's one thing for me to say it, but to have it confirmed by the World Health Organization and others, you know, is... is broad visibility to it. Yesterday you were saying that electricity is going to be a solution to uh, the, the cooking needs. Yeah, electricity is part of the solution. I mean, it's not the whole solution, but part of it. People forget that elect the cooking is not just one task. I mean, in my home, um, I had a student come to my uh, wife's, wife's kitchen when she was um, out shopping, and we we found 19 cooking devices in the kitchen. There was a waffle maker and a you know coffee maker and a popcorn maker and a water kettle and, and you know microwave and so she also had a stove. But sometimes she cooked on these other devices and yeah. these other devices are part of cooking. Yeah. They're very efficient electrical appliances. Yeah. And we so every time you flick a switch instead of flicking a match, it's healthier in the house because there's less smoke. So a rice cooker or a water kettle using electricity, very efficient. And so they're part of the solution. Now, the question is whether electric stoves can be part of the solution. Not in the old days. The old style electric stove, the, the coil that got hot on the stove, those are very inefficient. I mean, some places still use yeah. them. Yeah. But the new style on induction stoves are 50% more efficient. Yeah. And they're, they're, it's, an, it's a leapfrog technology. It's, you know, didn't exist. Your yeah. grandmother didn't have one. I mean, you yeah. know, it was a... Yeah. So they show a, a promise for um, um, taking a much bigger role in the future. So maybe you don't have to go from, you know, dung to crop residues to um, wood to kerosene to LPG. Yeah. You can jump over this. Yeah. Go right to electricity. And India, you know, unfortunately, still has not electrified all its houses, although yeah. it's moving in that yeah. direction. It will eventually electrify all its houses. Yeah. It has to. It's a, yeah. you know, it's a necessary part. And electric, electric cooking will be part of that. Yeah. But uh, so much of electricity, it's mm. a need. It would uh, generate uh, so much of more coal pollution from electric plants. So what do you see as a solution to coal-based coal electricity? Well, I mean, I'm a health scientist, and it's a lot better to burn the coal out in the power plant far away from people than it is to burn the biomass inside the house. So it's yeah. still better from a health standpoint. Yeah. Now, obviously, coal is not a you know is not a great fuel, and um, it can be burned much more cleanly. Though you can have cleaner coal plants. Then there's the carbon dioxide from the coal that adds to greenhouse gases. But one thing about when you electrify something, you're not stuck with a particular fuel. Yeah. You might have coal now, but you can have nuclear or yeah. wind or solar or yeah. you know um, hydro or something later. So electricity allows you to be very flexible. Yeah. And so, sure, it's coal now, but not in the long run. India's like every other country in the world's got to move away from coal. Yeah. Why not have the electric cooking ready? And besides which, cooking for the poor is not a big part of the electricity load. I, mean, yeah. I published a paper showed that if you change all the cooking in the developing countries, India and all the other developing countries, to induction stoves, 
It'd be equivalent to 3% of the electricity use in the, in the rich countries. Really? It's a very small part of it. I mean, it's not the cooking of the poor that are in this, the problem in the world in terms of uh, greenhouse gases. I see. So, uh, yes, it's, um, but it's still better from a health standpoint. I mean, think about it. You know, the stuff right under the woman's face. Yeah, yeah. Versus out of a power plant, you know, yeah, 100 yeah. kilometers away. I mean, it's yeah, not yeah. even close. I have seen my grandmother's cooking uh, mm. on, on wood stove. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to know your opinion about uh, uh, nuclear electricity, nuclear mm. energy. We were discussing it yesterday, and we had uh, some very bad uh, nuclear accidents. Mm. So, would you like to say something about it? What do you think about nuclear accidents and uh, its uh, contribution? Well, you know, m the first part of my career was on nuclear safety, nuclear waste, and, and this set of issues. I mean, that's how we're my, my doctoral degree and immediate years afterwards. Um, but I began to realize that, that as, uh, as a you know, person interested in health, that there was very little health impact from nuclear power compared to air pollution, compared to coal. Coal kills probably a million people a year around the world from air pollution, from coal mining accidents, and, and so forth. Probably more, uh, at least a million. So nuclear, uh, even the biggest nuclear ac accidents in history, like Chernobyl is the biggest one, at most, it killed 10,000 people. So that 10,000 people is bad, but it doesn't compare to a million. Yeah. So actually, the health risk is not a big part of the nuclear issue, in my opinion. No, other people, you know, the perception is different. People are afraid of radiation. But I think you're just as dead if you get die of cancer from radiation as you die of heart disease from air pollution. I'm sure you're just as dead, and your family misses you just as much. So as a you know, practical health scientist, adding up the numbers, nuclear just doesn't come up. But the reason to be concerned about nuclear so is... So you mean to say the, the risk from coal-based pollution or wood-based pollution mm -hmm. is uh, only a small fragment, fragment of uh, the nuclear... The, no, the other way around. The, the, the other way around. Yeah, yeah. The nuclear is a very small... Yeah. So the reason, to, my opinion, the reason to be concerned about nuclear power is not its health impact. But there are other reasons. If you um, divert the nuclear material from the power cycle and make bombs out of it, you know, that's, yeah. that's a really, you know, that's a yeah. different thing. Yeah. The other thing is that nuclear is very expensive and very sensitive. You have to have very good engineering, very good management. And if um, the power plant fails, you've got billions of dollars sitting there that you can't use. Yeah. So it's it's not reliable yeah. currently. And so, um, I mean, that's the reason they're not building in the United States now, is, is um, they're not reliable as financially. As investment. The investment side of it. Now, the nuclear industry will say, but the reason they're so expensive is because of all the safety regulations. Yeah. And they may have some point there. But the point is, there are, um, that it, the other, there are, there are other aspects of it. A nuclear industry is a global industry. So if a nuclear accident occurs in one place, all the nuclear reactors get shut down everywhere else in the world. Yeah. So they're vulnerable not only to their own safety record, they're, they're vulnerable to the, everybody else's safety record. Yeah, yeah. It makes it very difficult for a, private company yeah. to take on the risk. Yeah. That's not true. Coal plant blows up in India, it doesn't affect coal plants, you know, in, in California or yeah. wherever. So they're, they're not global industries. And airplanes are the same. An airplane crashes in one place, all the airplanes that, around the world of that yeah, type get, get um, so. That would they stop life uh, Yeah, so the, whole world. the airplane people know this. They have really good safety records because yeah. they're dependent and they have a lot of relations between yeah. countries to make sure the airplanes are safe. Well, nuclear, they haven't done that so much. So if a nuclear reactor has an accident in Japan, it affects the reactors in France. You know, so they, they, that's why the utilities don't like them, because they they can't control their own risk. I mean, you have witnessed India enough in mm. o over these decades, and you know mm. the, the kind of uh, workmanship we have here. Mm. So, would you be would you be confident about the safety of nuclear plants here uh, in India? Well, um, the um, it, it, India has um, 
like every country, a range of uh, things that does well, some things, and not so well other things. Yeah. If they put the energy and the best, their best people and their best management systems into yeah. nuclear, yes, I would be confident. Like it is doing wonderful in space. Yeah, science. in space now, in, in uh, electronics and you know, in compute and um, software and yeah. this kind of thing. Yeah. Will they do that though? Yeah. That's the question. I don't know. I mean, um, the um, if you put your best engineers and you, you know, very high quality control and maintain it, yes, I think they could. But will they? I don't know. You, you must have interacted with a lot of universities in India, students and teachers mm. and faculty. Mm. What do you think about uh, the standard of uh, research in Indian universities? Mm. Some of the prominent Indians, uh, they feel that it is much inferior and uh, uh, government should uh, send Indian research scholars to American universities. What would you say? Well, of course, many uh, Indian scholars do go to American universities, or British universities, or Australian universities. The problem is that many of them don't come back. And so I, you know, I have very strong opinions about this, having worked in some of the best universities in India, and there's some very excellent people, some very excellent research. But they, you know, they haven't opened themselves. I mean, I think India should um, open themselves up internationally. I mean, think of the U.S. We benefit greatly from Indian scholars that yeah. come to the U.S. Yeah, yeah. German scholars and British yeah, scholars yeah, yeah. and so forth. Yeah. We take we hire the best people. Yeah. India yeah, that yeah. makes the core of the economy. Yeah. But that isn't happening yet in India. You know, they only hire Indian um, scholars at Indian universities. China is just. I also work in China. China is starting to turn that corner. They are starting to, you know, like we did. We brought Einstein to work yeah, in the U.S. Yeah, he was yeah. he was German, but we brought yeah, him. Yeah. China is starting to do that. They're I starting see. to hire American or British or I maybe see. Indian scholars to work in China. That's I what see. you have to do. But that's a big step. Yeah. And you know, you know on the other it side, it might be politically unpopular. It would be. I mean, the other thing is, you don't offer them Indian salaries. You have to offer them international salaries. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be considered, that would be difficult, yeah, because, you know, the unequal salaries. But, you know, unequal talents produce unequal salaries. Yeah. So there's some, and then that maybe even a bigger problem uh, is the issue of, um, you know, why do, uh, one of the reasons the U.S. has, and Europe has, let's keep, stick to the U.S., such a strong scientific um, system is we have a lot of government expenditures on on research, but this is merit-based. Yeah, you have you know you have to really have a good proposal to do it. And you're yeah. not going to get the money without it. It's not the old boys network. It's uh, you know not because you're a senior professor. It's because you write a good proposal. So yeah. that is starting to come in India, but hasn't yet fully been implemented. So there is a long way to go. Well, I mean. Yeah, what's well, a long way? I mean, 10 years? I think it could be done in 10 years. Kirk, you have seen enough mm -hmm. of uh, India and the efforts to contain mm -hmm. pollution and mm -hmm. improve environment. Where do you see this country 10 years from now? A better environment or worse? How do you foresee the future of India 10 years from now? Well, you know, I focus mostly on air pollution uh, and, um, you know, household air pollution in particular, but also outdoor. I mean, uh, one of the things about air pollution is it's not a really a mystery what we can do in this conference. We listen to the whole set of it. I think, you know, yeah. Seoul did it, Beijing is doing yeah. it, you know, yeah. Mexico City did it. I mean, it's not magic. I mean, there's some special considerations in each country, but it's not, you don't have to invent any new technology. Yeah. You have to think of new ways of uh, incentivizing people. You know, I, I must say that probably the biggest single issue is governance. It's not the lack of laws, the lack of technology, it's the lack of enforcement. And that's a bigger problem than just the environmental area. I mean, you know, is um, governance. I mean, and like getting, uh, just enforcing things, not getting rid of most, of, you never get rid of all the corruption, most of the corruption. Put, put a few mayors in jail when they don't meet the, you know, the air pollution standards. Yeah. I and mean, it wouldn't take too many. Yeah. Put a few, um, you know, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you don't have to put them all in jail. They just, just a, needed to begin it. Yeah, just to begin and it. And it would be just changed. To say, to say you're serious about this. And yeah. that's what happens in the U.S. Yeah. It's, um, you know, actually, mayors get put it in jail. It is still not a criminal offense here. Yeah, right. But it is criminal. I mean, you're killing people. So, um, I mean, in my opinion. So, um and then, you know, my concern about the household pollution is, again, we know what the solutions are, electricity and gas and so forth. 
but personally, I think there's a kind of, I mean, I hate to say this, but a kind of rural bias and against rural people in India, that they're different yeah. from us. They don't, yeah. they'd be happy with things we'd never have. Yeah. People will want them to use them some kind of little stove that they'd never use themselves. Yeah. This, you know, that's, what are the ethics of that? Yeah. The people are the same as us. Yeah. In fact, our ancestors were rural. Yeah. I mean, your grandmother yeah, yeah. cooked on an open biomass stove. I can yeah. think of 98% of Indians in the 1950s were cooking on. Yeah, that's so, right. of course, they're the same as us. So why should they be treated differently? Yeah. One last mm -hmm. question. Where were you at the time of uh, Bhopal Union Carbide? Well, that's a very interesting question. Uh, I had a student um, um, taking measurements in Bhopal, in the outskirts of Bhopal. When it took place? She, she left two weeks before. So we have all these measurements just before the accident. And so I was in the U.S., um, but then I visited Bhopal uh, because this student was from Bhopal. And um, so I visited it after. How much time after that? Oh, I, was, I didn't get there until about six months or something afterwards. So I didn't see the immediate um, thing. But, uh, you know, what a disaster that was. You know, everybody agrees it's a disaster that the company, you know, really, uh, you know, uh, miss, you know, criminal actions. But I must say, the, the data about it, I mean, you know, as a health scientist, you know, the data have never been made available. I mean, you know, it's a kind of a scandal yeah, now yeah, that, uh, you yeah. know, after, what is it, 30, 40 years? I mean, 30 years. Um, yeah. It's, um, we still don't have, the scientific world can't investigate it. We can't learn from it in terms of the environmental health side. So I know there are politics and personalities involved, but that's another side to it. That's so did, did, you, did you have access to the data, health data? No, um, no, I never have. Um, you it, tried? Tried, not, very, not long ago, not recently. Yeah, um, but, but I know other he, colleagues have tried, and um, Indian colleagues can't get it. You know, it's they could get it. They can't get it, in, even in the country. So. Now, I'm not a real expert on this, but um, I mean, I'll tell you a little story. After the accident, I got a call from Union Carbine in my office, and they, they had heard that we were doing, had been doing measurements, you know, just before the accident. And um, they wanted to buy all of our filters. I see. You know, we had filters with air pollution measurements. And... Um, and uh, you know, I asked them why, and they said, "Well, we want to understand, you know, how much pollution there was before the accident, because you know we weren't we weren't measuring ourselves, so we don't know what the pollution was before the accident." And they were willing to offer—I can't remember—some really large number. And then I realized what they were doing is trying to buy some credibility. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. It was a lot of money, but I said, you know, I didn't think I would never get a visa again in India. If I, <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't sell it to them. Um, and you also thought that it would be unethical to sell that data to them? Well, I mean, um, the data, I would have, we don't sell data, I publish the data. It was actually the physical filters that they wanted them, mm. themselves. Yeah. I felt that was unethical. So that they could it would have, have taken it out of the public yeah. realm. Yeah. But it would have been a lot of money. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. Tell me one thing. It was the biggest uh, and worst kind of uh, air pollution. Accident. Air pollution, let us say, okay, of uh, yeah. an industrial accident mm -hmm. kind. Do you think the compensation responsibility to compensate should have been fixed in some other manner? Well, you know, again, I'm not, I haven't followed it really closely. I mean, uh, let's put it this way. There should be some standard mechanism that everybody agrees is fair, which was not the case in, yeah. in, in this case. I know it went up to the Supreme Court and, um, you know, and um, many victims feel they were not compensated correct, you know, enough, and I'm sure that's because true. Because developed countries are putting their hazardous plants in poor or underdeveloped yeah. countries, and it was one such case. That's right. They, Although I think one small positive outcome of the Bhopal accident, the terrible tragedy that it was, is that's happening less now. Yeah, yeah. Because develop, the companies realize, okay, it may be a poor country, but they're not... They're still going to get in trouble yeah, yeah, if something yeah. bad happens. Yeah, yeah. So I think it actually improved safety in the world. I mean, at the cost of um, thousands of lives in India, yeah, did improve safety in the world. So uh, you know, a small positive thing. I don't think you're going to have another Bhopal. Could you could you tell me about mm -hmm. your role in writing the report which had got a Nobel in 2010? Well. Um, you know, the, there's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and they've um, produced some um, periodic reports, and they've just had their fifth report. The first one was around 1990, and um, these involve thousands of scientists, um, 
and the, the one that was published in 2007, the fourth assessment, it was called, <coughs> that, um, you know, for the first time sort of def decided that there was definite evidence of human influence on the climate, um, was given, it was a Nobel Peace Prize, split the prize actually equally with Al Gore for his yeah. movie, yeah. and so half the prize went to the... Yeah, And IPCC. then they, um, there were 800 of the core scientists, which I was one, that were split the prize. Yeah. So they used the money, the IPCC, which is based in um, Geneva, yeah. used part of the prize winnings to, to make certificates for us I and see. send it to us, I see. which is very nice of them. They didn't have to do that. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, in one sense, we shared the prize, yeah. but of course... I mean, in another sense, you know, it was our names are not in the in, in, yeah, in, in, I, in a I book in Norway. Yeah. Um, so uh, you know, my um, publicity department at my at the university is always trying to put Nobel laureate yeah, after my yeah. name, and I'm always taking it yeah. off. <laughs> I mean, there are 30 people on at Berkeley campus that were also got one of these. Yeah, yeah. So it's not a Nobel Prize. Yeah. But it is a nice thing to be recognized. Actually, I have two, because. Um, in 1995, I think it was, the um, Pugwash um, got the Nobel Peace Prize. Pugwash was an international association of scientists who was working on nuclear, you know, trying to reduce the risk of nuclear war. So yeah. I was a member of Pugwash. Yeah. So I actually have two Nobel Prizes. It yes. is. Ah. Or, you know, one eight hundred one eight hundred of two. <laughs> so... I, I have not met many Nobel laureates, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, just a few of them. You still haven't met them. But, um, <laughs> um, I think in Germany, in Göttingen uh, University, I mm -hmm. met a couple of them. There. Yeah, well, there's some real ones there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. Um, so, Isn't uh, that the highest density in a small town of Nobel laureates uh, coming out of... Uh, well, University? I don't know. Berkeley has 11. And it's a pretty yeah. small place. Um, so in Berkeley, my campus... When you get a Nobel Prize, you get your own parking place. Really? Yeah. So when you walk around campus, you see uh, it, the sign. It says N R uh, N L only, Nobel Laureate only. I see. I see. Such so you can privilege. tell who you know where, where these guys park <laughs> Such a and what privilege. kind of cars they have. <laughs> so that's the joke. Um, you know, there's a real incentive to get a Nobel Prize when you might get a parking place. Thank you very much. Sure. It's okay. nice talking to you. You spared so much of time. Thank you very much. All right. Good luck. Friends, if you liked today's show, please go to youtube.com forward slash NRA Samay and click on the subscribe button. You will get notified every time we publish a new show. And you can also like us on our social media sites like Facebook, Twitter and Google+.